Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mary Monroe Brown, Director of the Wisconsin Office of Outdoor Recreation, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. On the screen, you'll see an image of me, a female with wavy brown hair wearing a blue jacket. As folks continue to join, I will quickly cover a few housekeeping items, which are written here on the screen as well. The webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to all registered attendees. Closed captioning for this webinar is available by selecting the CC icon in your Zoom toolbar. And as you listen to today's presenters, please feel free to share any of your questions by using the Q&A feature. We'll do our best to address questions at the end or we will follow up after the webinar. Thanks again for joining us for Small Changes, Big Impact for a More Accessible Outdoors. On the screen is an image of a group of four older adults engaged in cross-country skiing. One gentleman is utilizing an adaptive sled and wearing a festive helmet covering that displays the Norwegian flag and has horns. An older woman to his left walks along holding a tether to the sled. As a central hub for the state's outdoor industry, the Wisconsin Office of Outdoor Recreation provides resources, tools, guidance, and inspiration to uplift the industry for the economic health and overall well being of the state and its residents. Here are the same group of cross country skiers gathered around the campfire, enjoying warm beverages and a jovial conversation. Two on benches, or chairs on either side of the gentleman who is sled skiing. He's seated in his wheelchair and two men stand behind the group. As part of our work within the Department of Tourism, supporting the strategic imperatives to foster positive traveler experience for all and drive economic impact, we are thrilled to bring you today's expert lineup who will help us understand the accessibility criteria and considerations to incorporate into your projects in order to create a more welcoming experience for people with a variety of disabilities, as well as what information you can provide in your marketing materials so they can actually prepare for an outing. Creating accessible outdoor spaces opens the door for 1 million Wisconsinites affected by disability, as well as their family and friends. In addition to providing opportunity and making people feel welcome, wanted, and comfortable, as our friend Damian Buckman says, there is economic potential to be captured by making small changes. We know from a study by the Open Doors organization that nationwide, travelers with disability spend $58.7 billion over the two-year period of 2018 to 2019. To begin the conversation today, we're thrilled to welcome our presenters. As I introduce each panelist, their image will appear on the screen with their name, title, and organization. First, we'll hear from Lynn Dominey, Park Superintendent at the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore, who will highlight some of the projects that are making the park more accessible for everyone. Then we'll hear from Quinn Brett, owner of Dovetail Trails Consulting who will cover trail specific considerations and modifications that can make trails accessible for adaptive equipment and a wider audience. Sirene Negakairi, founder of Disabled Hikers and author of The Falcon's Guide, The Disabled Hikers Guide to Western Washington and Oregon, Outdoor Adventure Accessible by Car, Wheelchair and On Foot. We'll share how trail assessments can go further and what information should be included in materials to allow for visitors to prepare for their outing. And we'll wrap up hearing from Sarah Lysecki, Communications and Education Manager for the Fond du Lac based BCI Burke, a playground equipment manufacturer. Sarah will share universal design principles that guide their inclusive product lines and can be applied to your projects. And with that, I'll hand it off to our first presenter, Lynn Dominey. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lynn Dominey, superintendent at Apostle Islands National Lakeshore, also called Winnebuju Ominasan by the Ojibwe nations because it is their homeland. I'm, in, I'm a white female with medium length brown hair, wearing glasses and a gray shirt and green jacket with a gold National Park Service badge 
and I am joining you today from my office in Bayfield, Wisconsin. I am showing you here an image of I am showing you here an image that highlights a tall white lighthouse surrounded by green trees and sitting on a sandstone cliff filled with sea caves and blue green water, which is located 18 miles out in Lake Superior and is one of nine lighthouses located in the lakeshore. It is called Devil's Island Lighthouse. This image is a blue outline of the shape of Lake Superior showing that the lakeshore is located in the lower left southwest corner of the lake on a small peninsula and as a group of small islands surrounding Bayfield, Wisconsin, shown here by a red star. The map that I am showing is now a closer view of Apostle Island's National Lakeshore. The park consists of 12 miles of mainland shoreline, shown in green, which can be accessed in two locations by car. The rest of the park is on 21 islands spread out over 270 square miles with about 70,000 acres of land all reachable by boat. So something to think about, where do we even begin when dealing with such a giant lake and so many islands? You need to begin the accessibility with trip planning tools on your website. Two great examples for us are the NPS website at www.nps.gov backslash accessibility and Friends of the Apostle Islands website at www.friendsoftheapostleislands.org backslash website accessibility tools. The Friends website uses an accessibility interface from Accessibi and a video showing how to use it. So I encourage you to take a look. The next thing to do is to think about creating an accessible entry experience where the majority of your visitors will go, will go, which is what we do here at the Apostle Islands. Our main entry point here is the marina at Little Sand Bay. The image that I'm showing you are of the covered pavilions with accessible outdoor exhibits and a white and red fishing tug for everyone to look at as they enter the park. These outdoors exhibits include tactile and audio elements to broaden the audiences served. These include a geology exhibit with touchable cobblestones on the panel and audio boxes with push buttons to play interviews given by different Ojibwa elders, archeologists, fishermen, and other people who are connected to the islands. Here, when we are setting priorities, we fix the most obvious barriers first. The 16 steep stairs shown here are the only access to Myers Beach and are used by kayakers like the two women shown here carrying the orange sea kayak. The obvious fix is to replace the stairs with a V-shaped ramp, which will extend to the right of the stairs and will provide a gradually sloping alternative access route with side rails for sliding kayaks to and from the beach located at the bottom. And once we get our visitors down to the beach, we still need to provide access via sand mats across the beach and then into kayaks from wheelchairs as shown here where a middle-aged woman wearing blue clothing and a yellow life jacket and a blue hat is sliding from her wheelchair into the opening of a yellow sea kayak assisted by a female kayak guide also wearing a hat and yellow life jacket next to three other yellow kayaks. In addition to removing the obvious barriers, we look at accessibility geographically beyond the main entry point at the marina at Little Sand Bay. As shown on this map, three islands are located nearby offshore. The closest is Sand Island to the left, York Island in the middle, and Raspberry Island to the right. Because Sand Island is the closest island to the mainland, this is where we are focusing most of our island accessibility efforts. The next thing we do is to identify easy to reach attractions in close proximity to each other. On Sand Island, visitors go by kayak to see the sandstone sea caves carved into the shorelines as shown on the left and historic buildings like lighthouses. The right image shows the Sand Island Lighthouse, which is a beautiful brown sandstone red roof lighthouse with an attached light tower.
Next, we connect visitors destinations with raised wooden boardwalks. These boardwalks are carried in small pieces by hand and small mobile carts then installed like puzzle pieces across the wetlands, around the trees, and along the shorelines. They are constructed on metal frameworks that sit on top of the ground. Many of them are straight, but we often need to create hexagons around trees and at trail junctions like you see here. We also make our campsites accessible by adding them to these boardwalks. If you look, creating raised tent pads, tables, and fire pits on top of the boardwalks themselves. All the sites also have lake view and access to kayaks. Sometimes we just have to be creative to make the outdoors accessible. If you think about how to pitch a tent on top of a boardwalk, then you know that you might need special clips to anchor a, tip, a tent in between the boards on the boardwalk itself. In the left picture, you see a male park ranger showing two women how to use a clip to anchor a tent. These clips are stored in a box at every campsite. Additionally, the right image shows an accessible water fountain which hangs down from a wooden post and anyone wanting to fill a water bottle then pulls down the faucet which hangs over a drain. We also construct accessible privies with sliding doors all along our boardwalks. They are very popular with park visitors and are being shown by two men in park, on the park staff to a female visitor who has expressed interest in their unique design. We also create accessible meeting areas like big amphitheaters with black benches with back support and real, rear handrails and viewpoints with wheelchair accessible viewing scopes that look out over the lake and marina. A real key to our success is that we don't do it alone. The Friends of the Apostle Islands have created a funding campaign called Access for All. Their orange green blue symbol here is an infinity symbol laying horizontal with waves in the right corner. They have interviewed many accessibility advocates, including one whose quote is shown here. When I pick up a paddle, I am no more disabled than anyone else. Their website, again, is www.friendsoftheapostleislands.org to learn more about our efforts that we're doing together at Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. Thank you, Lynn, for kicking off this topic with examples of your great work. Let's turn to Quinn Brett for some specifics on considerations for accessible trails. Hi, thank you very much everyone for having me today. My name is Quinn Brett. I am a white female with short dark hair and I am wearing an orange flannel shirt. In 2017, I had a climbing fall that resulted in a spinal cord injury, and I am now a person who uses a manual wheelchair. I am paralyzed from the waist down. Before my injury, I was a professional climber and worked technical search and rescue in our national parks. My experiences recreating on public lands, the freedom of choice and ability I had, and my experiences in those places now as a person with a disability illuminated many things from our inherent social stigmas to missed opportunities. As a person with a disability would shake their head now and say, it's low hanging fruit, as Lynn pointed out, there's some obvious changes. How knowledge of trails managed uses, like who are the users on this trail, the designated uses, who, who is the one the one user on the trail that we're designing to, what user group needs the most support on this trail, i.e. if we allow horses, they need a wider trail, minimal steps and higher clearance. Knowledge of those things of how we design trails and the managed use and designed use type. So from trail classes, how does this trail classify in our overall visitor use management plan, the percentage and spectrum of minimally developed trails like which have indistinct tread to an improved trail, which is tread that is continuous and obvious, and fully developed trails, which is a tread that is wide, firm, stable. Knowledge of those um, managed uses and designated uses. And in addition to that, knowing the sustainability tactics and sustainable trail use, um, trail building, so like from socially trail building, so knowing how many people are gonna be on this trail? How are we more inviting on this trail um, to the environmental sustainability of a trail? 
how the trails um, have water drainage, all of those things. Um, and being able uh, and being up to date on newer mobility devices and technology, uh, knowing all three of these things from the designated uses to the managed uses to the sustainable trail uses um, can help in making the trails more usable for a variety of um, people, including those with mobility devices. My partner Joe Stone and I have been collaborating since early in my injury days, both being passionate and experienced outdoor athletes prior to our injuries, and now, even as people with disabilities. We have done a fair bit of webinar type educational hours in the last two to three, two to three years thanks to COVID, but now we have forayed into getting back onto trail with a variety of folks, organizations, and agencies. Our advocacy on the screen here um, is a variety of photos of from power wheelchairs to a manual wheelchair setting up a tent, another power wheelchair user um, hiking on a trail, um, and many different types of off-road hand cycles with desert settings and mountain settings. Those are all on screen at the moment. Joe and my advocacy uh, and consulting with Dovetail Trails focuses on educating about trail equipment. So the variety that you see here from power wheelchairs to off-road hand cycles and scooters. Um, of all the new technologies out there and how it functions. For example, the original technology of manual wheelchairs and power wheelchairs to the newer developed technology that while could be used indoors, is geared towards greater access in the outdoor environments, something that wasn't necessarily available to us without this newer technology in the last 10 years. Outdoor environments that were deemed not doable to people with disabilities, leading into exactly why we are using them, because we want to be outside and playing as well. So there's a nitty gritty of these definitions. On the screen, there are two photos. Uh, one is a variety of mobility devices on a single track trail. Um, above tree line on a mountain scene. And the second photo is of a single gentleman on a bowhead reach, a three-wheeled uh, mobility device, and he's wearing a bicycle helmet, looking like he's going a faster speeds. So the nitty gritty of these definitions, as people with disabilities, we're on a varied spectrum of how our bodies work and cooperate with us, with our legs and our arm muscles or our um, balance, et cetera. Um, the inability to sweat. Um, and so many of these devices are battery powered and they allow us and they are equalizers for us to get on similar terrain as those who are hiking. This leads to some of the many stigmas or misunderstandings that there are about people with disabilities. Knowing these devices, knowing why we're using them and why our, what our bodies are dealing with on a daily basis and how these devices help us get on trail are very needed. Um, and so on this photo, these devices are, are wheelchairs, they are our legs for hiking, but in some instances in non-wilderness areas, these same devices are also our, uh, the way that we bike. So what I found in my work is that information is key for, inform for anyone making a decision about the type of adventure they would like in their day. With this new technology, we are now more capable of accessing terrain assumed inaccessible. There are some key pieces of information and trail features that can make or break our experience. Do we go? Do we need a friend to support? How many folks do we need to rally in order to accomplish this trail? It's not a dumbing down of the trail. The first step is to make no changes at all to the trail. It just requires giving information about that trail. So on this slide shows the federal uh, trail sign information, which includes uh, the length of the trail, the average and maximum cross slope, the average and maximum running slope, the average and minimum width, and the surface type. So again, and there are some, first is providing that information. The second step, if we want to make some trail tweaks, is knowing the obstacles that are show, showstoppers. As Lynn said in her presentation, there are some obvious fixes like the inaccessibility of stairs, some obstacles or features might not be as inherently obvious. For example, wheelchairs are a variety of widths. Trails on federal lands, according to the Architectural Barriers Act, outdoor developed areas need to be 36 inches wide. 
This works for most every type of wheelchair, and it can be a great measure that, meant that meets the design standards for many user types, traffic, and sustainable trail needs. The gate to get in, for instance, as you can see here, this can be a game changer. If I can get, go to the trail, but I can't actually get to the trail, the trail itself might be perfectly fine in width, but the, the barrier and the stopping point is the parking lot to the trail, there's a gate. Another barrier might be extreme slop, cross slope with fall hazard. Um, something we might not notice on our walking legs, how the trail angles from the left to the right. But it can also be how, but it also brings up how sustainable is a trail that has an extreme cross slope for water drainage, for water drainage and overall use of that trail. So knowing that piece of information can help. How many, how many friends might I want to be on this trail or what device might work better for me? Next is uh, steps and landings. Again, depending on the managed use and designated use of the trail, are horses or bikes allowed, for instance? This is a picture of uh, a few steps in a row on a trail. And as you can see, the step in the foreground is quite large. Um, and due to the nature of that step being kind of high, most users, even on walking on their legs, have chosen to sidestep the trail, the steps on the left-hand side, there is an additional erosion or path that has been developed on the left side of the trail because of the steps. So it seems that most users don't like steps in the first place and nor is it the most sustainable. When it comes to trails, yes, there are designated legal accessible trails. These are needed in their own right, serving multiple purposes. They are without surprises because they meet specific standards and requirements, and we all know what those are like. But there's also the lack of funneling to these accessible trails, these very busy paved trails. There is also the wilderness experience that many people with disabilities have been missing and would like. And information is a key way for them to make that decision on their own. This is just a photo of a few people having um, experiences on trail. We have a person with a mountain trike in the upper left-hand corner on a brushy trail. A mountain trike is a two-wheeled, uh, a four-wheeled device with one wheel in the very back, a giant wheel in the back with levering propulsion. So he's sitting upright like a standard wheelchair, you would presume. On the right is a gentleman in a hand cycle, uh, reactive adaptations bomber. So he's in a kneeling position, hand cycling, leaning forward with his hands on a forested trail in Glacier National Park. And then on the bottom is a lake in the background and another, um, a group of hand cyclists all on a trail in Glacier National Park as well in a variety of mobility devices. So knowing what the trail information is and what the trails are like can allow people with disabilities to go places that they didn't necessarily think they could because now they have the information. Um, also within, within that, how, how can we provide this information? Are we doing a better job for all people with disabilities? So not everyone who is um, blind or low vision uses braille, but can we provide braille opportunities? Can we provide people um, with audio information about the trail and the trail map? Um, how are we rounding out this experience for people with disabilities? Our work, Joe and I, highlight to land managers, landscape architects, planners, and trail to supervisors. We provide opportunities to see a variety of these devices, how they operate on trail, and the human connection and the importance of nature and community through activity, in turn, opening eyes to the spectrum of trail experiences that are available for all. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Quinn. We appreciate your important work in this area and for sharing your expertise with us today. I'm going to turn it over to Cyrene Negakari to build on what we've just heard. Cyrene? Hi everyone, I am Cyrene Naga Nagakiri. I'm the founder of Disabled Hikers. On the screen here, you see our logo, which features three disabled people, uh, one walking with a uh, forearm crutches, one using a wheelchair, and one walking with their dog and situated in the natural landscape. Um, Disabled Hikers is a nonprofit organization that is really grounded in the broad disability community and really widening the ideas and the conception of what access means, particularly in the outdoors. 
and making sure that we are, you know, bringing in the entire disability community. Um, I myself have multiple disabilities and chronic illnesses. I have been disabled and chronically ill my entire life. And, you know, it took me a long time to come to the outdoors because it was something that never really felt accessible to me. I never had access to the kind of information that I needed, the community that I needed. Um, so I really had to figure out for myself what all of this meant. So um, I want to dive a little more into uh, a little bit of the types of trail information that we provide. Um, we create, you know, multiple trail guides as um, uh, Mary mentioned earlier, I am the author of the Disabled Hikers Guide to Western Washington and Oregon, and I'm working on um, several other guides forthcoming. We also have these types of guides available on the website. So um, again, just to go over some of this uh, information. So trail type is incredibly important to know. Um, if it's going to be an out and back or a loop, you know, for example, if it is a loop trail and I encounter a barrier that I'm unable to pass, you know, three quarters of the way around the loop, that means my hike is now gonna be twice as long as I originally set out uh, to begin. So I need to know that information. Um, distance, the entire length of the trail from start to finish. Um, that means from the time I start to the trailhead to the time I get back to the trailhead. And then um, if there's any places along that trail that will allow me you know, a good opportunity to turn back if I need to, having that information available as well. Uh, total elevation, elevation gain, and the elevation loss um, is also important. You know, for some folks, gain may be more difficult, loss may be more difficult. So knowing how much of the trail I'm going to encounter that is important. Um, the max grade, with, and we really narrow that down. You know, some of the guidelines allow for up to 30 feet. But for me, I need to know if there's going to be even a five-foot section of trail that is going to be very steep because that may be inaccessible for me. Um, and then, you know, a lot of these times we see these guides where, you know, they've pulled the data from, um, from various software and then they just say, oh, 10% of the trail is at X grade. Okay, what 10% of the trail? Where is that? So um, knowing where that is is important as well. Uh, the cross slope, um, again, it's the steepness of the trail and the horizontal axis. This is important for people, of course, who use wheelchairs, also people who may um, have uh, um, different in limb length, uh, may have uh, difficulty in their gait. Um, and, you know, it can be difficult for many people to walk on a steeply cross-sloped trail. So having that information is important. Um, again, the typical width and the typical surface, um, you know, where are those um, obstacles and barriers on the trail? You know, for me, walking on a rocky surface can be incredibly difficult. Um, stepping over a rock with, um, while using a walker or a cane can be incredibly difficult. So having that information available as well. And then trail users, who am I going to encounter on that trail? You know, I may not be able to move out of the way quickly if I encounter a mountain biker or a horseback rider. So having that information, knowing who I may encounter on the trail and so that I can prepare ahead of time to know that um, is really important so that I can judge, you know, my energy level that day, am I going to um, be able to move out of the way quickly enough? And the season and the schedule, knowing how the season is going to impact that trail where, you know, the potential muddy spots are, um, if, you know, I'll still be able to get across a bridge, um, information like that. Is there going to be access to water on the trail? And that includes water fountains, surface water that can be treated. You know, um, part of my chronic illness is that I have to stay highly hydrated, but carrying that amount of water every day is incredibly difficult. So knowing if I'll have access to water. Um, amenities like benches, restrooms, um, trail maps, and things like that along the way, uh, that information is often left out, but it can really make a difference between whether or not I attempt a trail if I know that I'm going to be able to sit somewhere, if I'm going to be able to access a restroom, um, yeah, all of that information. If it's dog friendly, um, and of course, you know, service dogs are allowed everywhere, um, all trails, all the time, but, you know, knowing if it's um, pet friendly or not may influence whether or not I want to bring my, uh, my service dog to that trail. Knowing if there's cell phone reception, you know, if I'm going to be able to call someone if I need help, if I'm going to be able to access the maps on my phone, if I get lost, having all that information is important. Knowing the path and entry fee and who to contact um, when I have questions about that trail. 
and then finding the trailhead, you know, and that includes directions uh, to that trail. Am I going to be driving a, you know, bumpy forest road? Is it a paved two lane highway? And then once I get to that trailhead, where do I find that trail from the parking area? And being very clear about that, um, particularly for people who may have difficulty with directions or difficulty processing information. Um, and then land acknowledgements should um, really be included in all of the information. It's really crucial as both an access and also as we are um, you know, considering how to be more just in our land management practices. And giving really detailed information about the entire length of the, tra of the trail and, you know, again, providing that really step-by-step -step or roll-by-roll -roll guide so that people have the information that they need to make decisions for themselves. Disabled people don't need non-disabled people telling us what is or is not accessible, just giving us that information so that we are empowered to make those decisions ourselves. Um, and then providing elevation profiles and very clear maps so that I um, will be able to, you know, tell where those steep areas are and how to navigate the trail. Now, rating systems are um, honestly pretty controversial, I would say, and, you know, but the biggest issue that we encounter is that there is no standardization about rating systems out there. What is easy to one person may not be easy to another. So um, here I've provided a list of, um, for the spoon rating, which is the rating system that I have created um, for our guides. Um, this is just for, for inspiration for you. Um, you know, the most important thing when doing rating systems is to be very um, clear and objective about what that means. So an easy trail is going to include these factors. Um, a moderate trail is these factors. A difficult trail is these factors. Um, and that may change based on, you know, your landscape and where you're located. You know, if you're in a place that doesn't have much elevation changes, then perhaps surface and obstacles may be weighted more heavily. So thank you. Um, you know, again, we're at disabledhikers.com. You can reach out to me or on Facebook and Instagram. Um, thanks. Thank you, Siren. This information is so useful. I know our partners will find it helpful in their work. I'm going to turn it over now to our last presenter, Sarah Lysecki, for some final thoughts on universal design for inclusive space. Sarah? Hi, thank you so much uh, for having me today. Um, just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Sarah. Uh, I am a white female, uh, blonde, and uh, right now I am wearing a gray zip up with a purple shirt underneath because we are the biggest, coolest, purplest playground company. Um, Brooke is 103 years old. We're headquartered in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin and apply, uh, employ about 200-ish people um, in manufacturing, engineering, distribution, marketing, accounting, and design. Uh, one of the things that we're really passionate about is educating people, our customers on universal design and really our overall goal, our passion, mission, and business centers around uh, having outdoor places and spaces that help people of all ages and abilities find the best of themselves through play. So we need outdoor spaces. Uh, I think many of us, and especially the people that have uh, presented before me, understand why and that it's so important for all of us. Uh, statistically, it's important because statistics show that living in a community with access to recreation spaces benefits residents in a lot of different ways. One of them is physically, there is a 10% lower obesity rate, 18% lower high blood pressure rate, higher property values. So from an economic standpoint, higher property values, lower unemployment rates, just kind of general information, higher graduation rates, better air quality, less smoking and better biking and walking scores for the community. So these outdoor places and spaces are important for so many reasons from a physical to an economical standpoint and just general overall community health. The overall spend that we say that, uh, or that research says that we need, that communities need to spend per resident is about $20 to start seeing some of these results. So about $20 per resident will yield some improved uh, improvements in your community's health and overall wellness. So we talk a lot about play for all. Um, it's been a theme as we've gone through this presentation today uh, in different ways. Uh, a lot of times we're talking about children um, and access 
and equity for children. Uh, it's also for the parents and the caregivers that come. And then it's also for this intergenerational play and engagement that we seek uh, to provide and foster with our play spaces. So serving a community really means serving everyone in the community. We meet ADA standards by law, very important. Uh, I would never say that that's not an important thing, um, but it's, and it's necessary. However, to have an environment that's truly inclusive, we need a lot more than that. This is where we start to talk about universal play design. Uh, and universal play design or universal design in general was developed to ensure that products and spaces can be used comfortably by all people, regardless of ability, preference, which I think is key. Universe, and universal design goes above and beyond access and promotes the uh, creation of equitable environments by applying these seven principles, which we'll look at, to play spaces, parks, outdoor exercise areas, or really any public spaces, we plan to in, uh, include and highlight people's diverse needs and abilities. So what we've talked about thus far and kind of applying it to the places and spaces that we at Burke design and promote. And so there are seven principles. Um, I'm just going to read them through and then we have a couple examples. So principle one is equitable use. I think you'll see that uh, a lot of the themes from these uh, go through everybody else's presentations as well. Uh, the design is useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities, flexible. The design accommodates a wide range of individual preferences and abilities, simple and intuitive use, having the use of the design be easy to understand regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language skills, or even concentration level. Perceptible information, the design communicates necessary information effectively to the user regardless of ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. Number five is tolerance for error. We wanna minimize hazards uh, from the playground industry to trails, minimizing those hazards and adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. Low physical effort, a theme that's been through, we want the design to be used effectively and comfortably and with a minimum of fatigue for everyone. And finally, size and space for approach and use. Appropriate size and space is provided for approach, for reach, for manipulation and play in our case, and use regardless of the user's body size, their posture, or their mobility. So from a play perspective, what does universal design look like? I have a couple examples here. So you can see that the blue is parallel. So there are certainly things that a user with the mobility device or a sensory processing could use. And then there is you know, the, some of the climbing or some things that might not be available to everyone and the spaces are completely separate. That does not foster engagement. That does not allow everybody to get to the most exciting piece and really work and play together. In the middle in the orange is integrated. So it's a little bit more together, but things are still separated and people aren't really engaging in the way that we're hoping to foster through play, fostering that empathy and understanding. Full universal design means the most exciting piece is accessible to everyone in the best way possible. And that there are different pieces throughout the space that really speak to everyone. So a lot of play variety and something that really helps everyone find the best of themselves through their play experience. A couple of key products. Uh, swinging is something that's extremely important to a lot of children. It's sort of a childhood staple. Uh, this is the happens to be the Brava Universal Swing, and it's really a gateway to independence for children of varying abilities. Uh, it has a very different design, and kids can swing themselves not just by pumping their legs, but actually utilizing their upper body, their core, or even just rocking back and forth. Uh, it's actually also designed to mimic stimming behaviors, so children on the ASD spectrum can participate in an activity that's comfortable and calming for them while they build confidence by participating in group activities and children with other varying abilities. So I call out autism uh, specifically here because sometimes I think the focus is on, at least in play and for children in playgrounds, uh, is often on things that we can see. Uh, sometimes autism is a differing ability that we can't see. Um, and according to the CDC data, the prevalence of children with autism is on the rise. 
Uh, one in 54 was diagnosed in 2020, which is the latest statistics available, uh, up from one in 58 just four years ago. So we start to think about the design of spaces, of places to have a transition to the play space so that it's not overwhelming. Swinging and spinning are really beneficial pieces also for this type of environment. So we're trying to make sure that everybody has access and equity in their play experience on a regular basis. So we have the Serenity Spot, which is another piece designed specifically, well, it's designed for all children, but it's designed with children on the ASD spectrum in mind because there is a mirror and children on the ASD spectrum sometimes are working on facial expressions or they're working on things like smiling, uh, they're working on eye contact. So putting a mirror there assists with that as well and helps for emotional expression. There are some additional stimming pieces here, a flap for kicking. So all children will use the space this way, but it's designed with thoughts of children on the ASD spectrum and normalizing some of those behaviors so they don't feel like they can't express them. There's a major part of inclusive play is providing places where all people can play independently if they choose. Part of independence in play is feeling empowered to navigate a situation alone. This product that's shown here is an Innova rocker and an Innova bridge. And basically there is a child comes on, does not need to make a transfer from their mobility device if there is one. And the bridge and the rocker automatically provide a little rocking stimulation. If a child has use of his or her upper body, they're able to rock utilizing that. Other children will stand and rock, sit and rock, be on the outside. So it's really this gathering space that a child can be on with their mobility device, a child who can run past and through, the, a child can stand or sit. So it's really speaking to everyone's comfort level and it's become a place for everyone. And then finally, we just have an example. This is a very large uh, space uh, located in Louisiana, actually. It's the largest inclusive playground there. And there's just a couple of things. Uh, each of the white numbers indicate something that is really important from a universal design, access, and equitable standpoint. So you can see that number one is some surfacing. It's smooth. It's accessible. Uh, the colors and the shapes contribute to perceptible information of play areas. Uh, number two is we want children to explore, to adventure, to experience awe within the play space. So having a tower where a child can climb to the top, climb down, keeps older children engaged and hopefully off of their screens. So lots of opportunity for everyone to engage in the same space. We have some slides. Uh, sliding is another universal childhood activity. Children with cochlear implants can often not experience sliding in the same way because they cannot have static. So number three there is a slide that's a roller slide. So it provides some stimulation for that's helpful for a lot of kids, but kids on the ASD spectrum, while children utilizing cochlear implants can also play on this slide because it doesn't have any static. So it gives an equitable play experience. Number four is some comfortable seating. We want caregivers not to be tired if they need to either pull a mobility device up to a picnic table or a place to sit. We want them to be able to supervise their children comfortably and in a place that's accessible to them. So having some seating within the play space instead of on the outside is a really nice way to encourage and foster that engagement. A couple different types of swings. It's a little bit hard to see, I realize, in this, but having just swinging options, something that a child can transfer into, something that they can swing themselves, pump their legs, like the Brava swing that doesn't need to have a leg pump and a child can independently transfer. Just lots of different options to really speak to everyone's individual abilities and preference. Number six is some zip lines. Zip lines are adventurous and they're fun. Uh, everybody kind of waits in line to be in them. So to have an opportunity for a child to transfer from a mobility device, safely and have a belted seat situation has been something that we've really utilized to equalize the play experience. Play is a great equalizer if we allow it to be. And then finally, number seven, actually, I'm sorry, two more. Uh, number seven is having ramps. 
ramps create this automatic accessibility. Uh, I know in the first presentation, they talked about some you know, larger spaces for turning. We want to make sure we have turning radiuses where children utilizing mobility devices won't feel stuck or that they can't make a turn. Um, but having that, we want to have, have the size and space for approach and use, which number seven actually speaks to principle number seven in that case. And then now finally, uh, games in the play space help with that cognitive development. So you can see in number eight, there's some music there. There's an opportunity for kids to play alone parallel to another child or some start developing cooperative play. But it allows for kids who don't maybe want to move and run or move around the ramp system in a particular day to have a space to kind of develop some cognitive abilities as well. So lots of different options as far as accessibility and use and equitable use within a play space that we can design into. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks to all of our presenters today for sharing their unique perspective and expertise on this important topic. That's all we have time today. If we were unable to address your questions, we will look forward to following up with you directly. Please feel free to send us an email if you have additional questions. And we will be sending out a recording of the webinar. Thank you again to our presenters and to all who were able to join us live today. Have a great day.